Hi everyone, and welcome to Parramatta Baptist Church online for 2022. Uh, a happy new year to you all. During January, our desire is that this would be a time of refreshment, a time where you draw near to God, engage with Him. And to facilitate that, we'll be looking at three topics over these coming weeks. We'll be looking firstly uh, at our identity in Christ and the difference that makes. Secondly, uh, what it means to engage in heartfelt worship. And in the third week, uh, we'll be looking at what it means to live with a persistent faith. As part of doing things just a little bit differently uh, in a fresh way over January, uh, what we'll be doing is changing the service structure a little as well. As you engage online, uh, there will be three components of the service. The first is that you'll be invited to engage with a story from the gospel. You'll be guided through the story um, in, in just wanting you to enter into that story. Secondly, there will be a short message that comes out of that gospel story. And thirdly, in each of the weeks, we will have an amazing testimony from someone here at PBC. And we trust that you will be inspired and encouraged by each of these testimonies. Our desire um, is that through these weeks that you would be encouraged, that there would be in that sense of engaging with God. And so what we would love for you to do is to prior to engaging online, uh, to actually centre yourself, prepare yourself for the time that you will spend in the service. Uh, there won't be any worship music as part of the online service, and so you may wish to uh, spend some time uh, just listening to or singing some, some Christian worship songs uh, prior to engaging. It may be that you centre yourself uh, in a time of prayer or some other way in which you actually bring yourself ready to engage online. We really do trust that it will be a time of refreshment and renewal as you engage uh, with these three services. Given the way uh, that COVID has been progressing over the past few weeks, uh, but also the way in which we have now designed these three services, we will not be meeting on January the 9th, January the 16th, or January the 23rd. Our hope and our intention is that we will resume in-person gatherings on Sunday the 30th of January. But for the three weeks prior to then, uh, we would encourage you to, uh, to engage online and to make the most uh, just of what uh, we'll be doing in engaging with those gospel stories. Please be in prayer for us as a pastoral team. Um, commencing the 17th of January, uh, for three days, we'll be doing our planning and preparing as part of our retreat. Um, it's a time that we're looking forward to, um, but also a time where we really desire to be um, led by God in the decisions we make and the things that we discuss and the things that we plan for this year. We would appreciate your prayers, uh, as you would understand. It is difficult at this time to, to plan with any great precision, but our heart's desire is to do that and to really seek the Lord through those three days. So we would appreciate your prayers. Well, God bless you all. Just allow me to pray for us um, as we begin this service. So Father, we thank you for the freshness of this new year. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who is with us at all times. Uh, Father, I pray that each one of us uh, would have that sense of drawing near to you through this time, that we would be intentional in creating time and space, and not just physically, but also emotionally and, and mentally, uh, that we would enable ourselves uh, to be present before you and to hear what you have to say to us as we listen to your word, as we engage with your word, uh, Lord, and as we come before you in prayer and in worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you uh, for who you are. We thank you for all that you have done and all that you continue to do in our lives and in the life of Parramatta Baptist Church and your church as a whole. May we as your people, uh, Lord, continue to seek to bring you glory in all that we do and say. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, hello. As we enter into this January series, I want to invite you to enter particularly today into the account of Jesus restoring the demon-possessed man at Gerasenes as it's recorded in Luke 8, 26 to 39. So I'm going to read the account slowly and I want to invite you to, to just imagine yourself in this story. 
So using your senses, what do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? What do you feel? Just use your imagination to try and enter this story as I read it through slowly. So close your eyes um, and just imagine yourself here. They, being Jesus and the disciples, sailed to the region of Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. Though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon to solitary places. Just imagine what is going on in that scene right now. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly, do not order us to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to go into the pigs and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man and went into the pigs, the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Just again, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel? When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. Again, just picture that scene. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged Jesus to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, go home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and he told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So if you've had your eyes closed, you might want to open them up. And I'd just love you to take a moment to consider what stood out to you in this story. And if you're watching with others, why don't you pause at this point and just share with each other what is it that stood out to you from this story? The Gospels tell us that Jesus did many miracles and yet only some are recorded in detail. 
And so the ones that are should cause us to consider what does stand out in this story? What might God be wanting us to recognise or to understand? To be perfectly honest, and this is a little embarrassing, but the thing that used to stand out to me most from this story was cruelty to animals. As an animal-loving young person, I was not very impressed that Jesus would send a herd of pigs to their death. But over time, I came to realise that, that was not really the point of this story. The focus of the story is, of course, the man. He was so broken and isolated. Surely once he had been loved, or at least raised by his parents. So what had happened to him? How did he end up homeless and given over to evil? Was it his own poor choices? Or had life dealt him a bad hand? Or perhaps both? And was his meeting with Jesus a random coincidence because Jesus' boat was blown across the lake in a storm and this was where he happened to land? Or could it be that this man had been seen by the Heavenly Father who directed Jesus to go to him, driven by compassion and a relentless commitment to restore? On a different occasion, Jesus explained to his actions saying, I only do what I see the Father doing. Certainly verse 22 of Luke 8 says that one day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. You now we get the impression that this was a deliberate meeting. When Jesus first encountered the man in the cemetery, the man's identity had been robbed. I mean, this wasn't who God had created him to be. He wasn't designed to be so tormented by evil spirits that he would present as crazy and unpredictable. He wasn't created to live alone in a cemetery among the dead. He wasn't designed to be so desperate that he would cut himself. He was a son, purposely purposefully created for relationship with God and with people. He was seen by God and loved. The broken exterior and the torment would not be allowed to define him any longer because this was not who God purposed him to be. He was a beloved son, one whom Jesus would entrust with the most important task that anyone could do. And so Jesus went out to find the man. And with all of the authority of heaven, he saw through the broken facade to the evil one who seeks to rob us of life and relationship and sometimes health. He undermines relationships so often seeking to isolate us because, quite frankly, we're easier to undermine when we're cut off from others. And so Jesus spoke to the evil one who would seek to rob, steal and destroy this man that God had created and purposed for more. Evil would no longer be allowed to control. It was a single command from the one who had authority. Though evil had had a claim on this man, he actually really belonged to the one who had created him. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we see this again and again in the in the Gospels, evil spirits submit to Jesus' authority. They have no choice but to obey. And so we come to the pigs. It wasn't intended to be a mass slaughter of, of animals. In fact, if you read the passage closely, it was actually the evil spirits who instigated the idea of the pigs and who brought their destruction. 
And so for us, really, the pigs serve as a visible demonstration of how hell-bent on destruction the evil one really is. Satan and his demons will take anyone or anything down. But at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every spirit submit to his authority. And so the man was now clothed, sitting at Jesus' feet and in his right mind. Peace and freedom at last. Tastes of who he was created to be, surrendered to Jesus at the feet of the one who loved him and who had a purpose for him. Was his purpose to go with Jesus and join the growing band of disciples who went where Jesus went? Because the man wanted to. His gratitude was so great that he would have followed Jesus to the moon and back if Jesus had given the word. To some, the command was to physically follow, but not to this one. His mandate was to go home and tell others what Jesus had done. (laughs) Do you think he would have even needed an opening line? Or was the mere fact that he was now clothed and in his right mind and back among people, all the conversation opener that he needed. And can you imagine people's reactions? Weren't you the guy who... What has happened to you? Sometimes Jesus commanded those who were healed not to tell others what had happened to them because the crowds would, would just gather in response to their testimony and they would hinder Jesus from doing what he had come to do. But for the people of this town, in this region of Gerasenes, they were far enough away, far enough perhaps, that they might not otherwise hear about Jesus, especially given that Gerasenes was a Gentile town. And we know that Gentiles were the religious outsiders, which adds, in fact, another layer of significance to this story. Jesus didn't just cross a lake. He crossed the religious divide, demonstrating once again that he came for all. Do you know that this man who Jesus restored became the first Gentile disciple? And the first disciple to be sent off on his own to share about Jesus. I love the final sentence of this account. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Because the people of his town needed to hear about the one who can bring freedom and restoration the one who goes looking for the broken and the oppressed, the one who can deliver from evil and bring peace, the one who loves and who welcomes all people to be his followers, the one who has a purpose for even the most broken, the one who forgives the wrongs of our past and the one who saves. This man's life would speak and this man's words would speak. And this was a story worth knowing. There is no one too far from God that he can't find them. There is no one too broken that he can't heal them. There is no one too repulsive or unacceptable that Jesus wouldn't clothe them and sit with them. Anyone can be restored by Jesus. So I want to invite you to pause at this point and I want you to just take some time, take a few moments to think about who are those in my life or that I know of who are really far from God, who really need God's restoration in the ways that we've been talking about perhaps. It may be someone that you know of remotely. It may be someone that you know personally. Or it may even be you. But I'd love you just to think through, who is it 
that really needs God's restoration and try and be specific in that. And then, would you pray and would you ask in faith that Jesus would come and do his restoring work in them? You know, stories of restoration and deliverance didn't just happen in biblical times. They may present differently today, but for the person who is freed from a stronghold that the evil one has had on them, they know the difference that it has made. They know their before and after story of what freedom has brought. Let's hear Richard's story. Hi, my name is Richard, and I've been a part of the church for a few years. And uh, you may have seen me in the, in behind the sound desk, which is the team that I've been serving the church in. Now, this is some of my story about how God set me free in a particularly dramatic way, and uh, I feel that it's very much worth sharing. But first, I think I should you know, start, like all good stories at the beginning, with some context. When I was born, my parents were uh, pretty wealthy people and had everything that anyone could aspire to have or, or own and, or dream of, really. I mean, they had uh, a mansion with wine cellars and a chauffeur and even a helicopter to work. By the time I was four, they had lost everything. And they uh, lost what little we had after that again a second time when I was six. That pretty much meant that the rest of my childhood, we were uh, pretty much living at the poverty line a couple of times above and mostly below. And uh, my dad actually ended up being unemployed for most of the time until I finished high school. Yeah. As you can imagine, the consequences that uh, that left on the family and even the circumstances that led to all that taking place left a really broken family environment and some very volatile parents who uh, took it all out on each other and, uh, and us kids in many, many ways. My mum was really bitter about losing the life of luxury she'd had and worked really hard to get and amongst other things, uh, turned to alcohol as a crutch to get through life. My dad largely shrank into himself and just um, was never there in any meaningful capacity until he passed. My parents at the same time were involved in church life, and uh, even if their lives weren't really reflecting the values that they wanted or aspired to live, they wanted to be seen to be living them. And that meant that despite the activities at home and at church being different, they made sure that there was no hint of how toxic home life was that ever made their way to anyone in the church, even, uh, even though we tried at times. And this was the state of things for pretty much the entire time I lived with them. Uh, it's really a mark, that, um, a mark that it left on us that's not to be understated in how serious that was in creating challenges that are difficult to overcome, that I have overcome, and, and some that I'll have to live with. My siblings were so badly damaged by this that uh, they turned to alcohol, drugs, and organised crime to get by. That same path was, was there for me to walk if I chose it, and uh, I very nearly did. Many people would ask me uh, why I didn't, and I feel it's fair to explain that the only way I know the answer to that is in looking in hindsight. God really put the right people in the right places at the right time in my life to save me from making the worst mistakes. Made plenty on the way, definitely. But the very worst ones he saved me from to correct the course of my life to, to be where it is now. And along the way, he taught me to think about the long term and how the decisions that I made at any point in time had cascading consequences for the future and um, how that was much, much, much more worthwhile a way to live. I fully believe that one of the consequences for me growing up in such a toxic environment was that I began to choose the wrong path out of necessity. Um, and, and really in fitting with the, the world that I existed in. And the prime example of this, which is uh, the key to this story, is how I came to be so heavily influenced by rage. Uh, I was about 14 at the time, and it was a really bad day, a particularly bad day in a particularly bad week in a particularly bad month. And uh, I had some health troubles at the time. They were not insignificant, um, but that meant that I was at the receiving end of everyone's pro problems at that time, just because I was the point of focus. Uh, I was really rather angry about that because I was having so many troubles that I needed help with and decided that uh, the next family member to try something was going to be met with all the anger I could muster. So when that happened, 
uh, I responded with all that anger. And it was really different to what I expected, a much more powerful thing that felt very different. But it stopped them in their tracks, and uh, from that point, it was a tool that stuck with me and began to uh, be a thing that whenever I got angry, I'd just blow out into rage almost immediately. And so life continued. I, I moved out of home and I started working in corporate sales to pay the bills and, of course, began to work my way up the corporate ladder whilst being involved in the church that I felt God wanted me to be a part of at that point in my life. Uh, so I was in small groups, uh, serving on teams, and really just actively trying to pursue faith and what that meant in my life, to, to live it, and all the kind of normal stuff that Christians do. And even in the midst of all that, and actually really seeing some fruit of God's work in my life, I still had this problem of rage. I, uh, I have a psychology degree, so I um, looked into the human factors of it and decided that it was attributable to the environment I grew up in. And so I decided to put in some strategies to try and deal with it and, and to exercise it from my life um, with having very tight self-control. And I would remove myself from situations that would be likely to trigger it. I wouldn't go near the people or places that would be likely to trigger it and wouldn't even talk about certain topics of conversation just to try and prevent those trigger points. Uh, I also would go to the gym lots because I found that really calmed me down and I couldn't always avoid all the other things. So that being in the mix really helped. But as I climbed the corporate ladder and took on more responsibilities, the demands on me grew a great deal and I had less time for all those strategies. It's, it's just not something you can do when you're permanently busy. And I remember noticing how different my weeks were relative to when I made it to church. And the weeks when I made it to church and small groups, it was just good. Life was, by comparison, a wonderful thing. Uh, when the weeks when I missed those things, uh, so much extra temptation and so many other unforeseen problems that became big problems that I couldn't manage and the rage grew and became something I couldn't avoid or control. And as that was happening, uh, I was in the lead up to getting married, so I decided it was something I should deal with in any way I could, because I really, really, really didn't want to take that into marriage. So I sought out some help from people I knew who were involved in uh, prayer ministry. We set up some time and um, it's, it's really quite difficult to try and explain what happened in that time to someone who hasn't been through it. So the best I can do is to give you an analogy. It's kind of like when you've been wearing sunglasses for a long time and you take them off, even if you haven't been aware of them when you're wearing them. When you take them off, you know that they've been there because the pressure change. Or like when you've been wearing a backpack for a long time and you forget that it's there. When you take it off, you definitely still notice that it was there. It's definable by its absence. So the immediate change for me, it was a very immediate change. It felt different immediately. And I started responding to circumstances differently. I, I could talk about the things I couldn't talk about before, go to the places I couldn't before. Life was just so much more open. And, well, at least from my perspective, the true test was actually talking to the people around me, and uh, they actually had all noticed it. Um, and they wanted to know what had changed, um, or what I'd done at very least. And it was just so freeing to be rid of that thing. And life has really been a, a different place for me since much more vibrant and colourful and beautiful than what I possibly imagined it could be. Uh, the, the one strange thing, though, has actually um, been I've had to relearn who I am in many different circumstances because I had this established pattern of behaviour and it was being triggered by something that wasn't there anymore. So I had to figure out how I would respond in certain ways. The other thing about it was when making those decisions and contemplating things more carefully, there was so much less noise. It was actually able to think much, much, much more clearly. And that meant, uh, well, apart from just more deeper contemplations and better decisions, uh, also deeper relationships. And uh, it's really quite clear to me, in hindsight again, <laughs> that this is something I really should have dealt with a lot sooner. I mean, the impact of this is that I probably wouldn't be married today. I can quite definitely say I wouldn't be married today if this was still a problem. But I still have a, a, a beautiful wife and a son. And something that uh, I would have dealt with a lot earlier, I mean, I tried, but I just didn't know that it was a spiritual thing. So I would greatly encourage anyone who's got this kind of thing going on in their life to seek out their help from a prayer team and prayer support. 
If Richard's story has raised something with you that you need to process, then please be in touch with one of the pastoral team. Do you know, in our sophisticated, modern, Western world, we often downplay or deny the reality of Satan, but in doing so, it renders us powerless in the spiritual realm. Because the biblical truth is that Satan will will seek to rob, kill and destroy, exerting his power over people wherever he can. But Jesus, the one with ultimate authority, trumps that of the evil one. Satan is a defeated foe. Jesus won the victory over him when he went to the cross and rose again. Revelation tells us that when Jesus comes again, Satan will be thrown into hell for the final time. But you know, right now, we live in the meantime. Satan has been defeated, but he hasn't yet been cast into hell. And so in this meantime... Satan and his demons will do all that they can to bring destruction to as many as possible. I don't know if you noticed from the story in Luke 8 that when the pigs drowned, the herdsmen rushed into town to report what had happened and Luke tells us that that all the people in the town, they went out to see what had happened. And it says that when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out from sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind. And it says they were afraid. The passage goes on to say those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because it says they were overcome with fear. And so he got into the boat and left. For followers of Jesus in 2022, we can sometimes choose to avoid the topic of Satan and the realm of evil. We just don't want to think about it because like the townsfolk, we're afraid. And so we'd rather ignore it or just brush it to the side than take up the authority that we have in Christ to recognise the attacks of the evil one as they come and deal with whatever the attack might be. And so I want to say two things. Firstly, to every follower of Jesus, Christ has defeated Satan and you have the authority of Christ as a follower of Jesus. I really love the illustration of our identity in Christ, our authority in Christ, being like a police officer's uniform. And so if I were to go down to Old Windsor Road and just dressed as I am now, and if I were to attempt to direct traffic, I'd probably get run over. But if I were to go down there dressed in a police officer's uniform, all of a sudden drivers would respond. For all who are in Christ, remember that you are wearing a police officer's uniform in the spiritual realm. Satan will respond to the authority of Jesus in you. In 2022, I pray that we will recognise the ways that the evil one might be coming against us or coming against our families or our workplaces or our neighbourhoods, or just people that we know. And that we will take up our authority in Christ and command the evil one to leave. And so if you want to chat more about that, you just let me know. Secondly, for those who may have resonated with something in Richard's story, and you have been wondering whether there may be a spiritual stronghold in your life, something that perhaps that um, torments you or it keeps you bound, perhaps an issue that you just keep circling around and around where even in spite of counselling or your best efforts, you just can't seem to find freedom in that thing. Or perhaps at times you sense like a dark presence or something foreboding, something that causes fear. Maybe it's in your home or elsewhere. 
you personally do have the authority to pray. But PBC also has a prayer ministry team who are, who are experienced in praying deliverance um, and praying spiritual freedom into people's lives and homes. We do it by appointment and so please contact Elizabeth Gay or myself if you would like to explore that more. It's all kept confidential. In 2022, may we be people who, like Jesus, see through the broken and tormented facades and take up our authority in Christ to walk in the freedom that Jesus gained for ourselves and also that we will be people who bring freedom to others as well. Would you pray with me? Oh, Jesus, I want to thank you that we don't live just buffeted around in the battle, but Jesus, I want to thank you that because of you, we have your authority and we walk in your victory. And so, Lord God, I just want to pray that we would be people who would indeed actually walk that out, walk your victory out. Lord, I pray that we won't just ignore the attempts of the evil one to bring destruction in us, in our relationships, in, in circumstances around us, in our city. Lord God, I pray that we won't just turn a blind eye or just choose to live with it. But Lord God, I just pray that we would take up our authority and just pray freedom and victory in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that in 2022 we would increasingly be people who are quick to recognise where the evil one is at work, Lord, that we would, we would be bringers of freedom. Lord, that we would walk in that freedom for ourselves and that we would bless others and bring that freedom to those around us and to places around us where we go as well. God, I thank you. Thank you for all that you've done through Jesus Christ. Amen.